19. We're uh, continuing in the series, the forward series, and uh, we have so much, so much, so much uh, that we must cover. And I'm hoping that uh, the covering of these uh, ideas and principles will be life to all of us. Luke chapter number 19, verse 41. If you were here earlier in our service, you heard the first half of this sermon uh, text that was read uh, during the invocation. Uh, but I'll give you a quick summary. This is uh, the text that talks about the triumphant entry of Jesus. And uh, it is important that we understand that there is a great amount of fanfare that is going on right now where Jesus is uh, riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And uh, he's on his way to Calvary and he's being celebrated. People are throwing off their coats and people are waving palms. Thus we get Palm Sunday. Huh? It's, kind of, it's kind of good, right? Right? Thank God. All right? And, and, and it's a lot of celebration. Everybody's very much celebrating the entrance of who they thought and hoped would be the king, their king, their new king, someone that will liberate them from their uh, oppressor, the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed be uh, your name. And everybody's having a good time. And, and the Pharisees, you know, all the haters. I mean, you always going to have some haters in the crowd. Yeah, everybody know that? All right. Uh, ask your neighbor, you're not a hater, are you? Come on, ask them that. It's okay. Just make sure. Amen. If they are, just tell them, don't hit on me today. I, I need love. Right? Love. Love is what I need. And so, so, so they, they were mad that people were, you know, saying all this. And, and, and they told Jesus, tell saying this. And Jesus said, you know what? If they stop talking and praising my name, the rocks will cry out. Amen. We sing the song in an old church saying, ain't no rock uh, going to cry in my name. Uh, I'm going to cry in my name. Come on. Uh, good. Good. Wish, I, wish I had a musician. Or you can follow along, it says, and as Jesus came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground. You and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. So Jesus went to the temple, began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said to them, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer, but you made a den of robbers. You know it's bad when Jesus pretty much calling everybody in the church thieves. Mm. Amen. Uh, He's on with that, amen. Amen. You know, it's like, you know, very interesting. You know, uh, the, 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 when you look at the life of Jesus, he was he was very nonviolent, except when he dealt with these thieving church leaders. I don't know what to make about that. I mean, I could make something that, but then you more ask Jesus on that. So I don't be too irresponsible. But I tell you what. Jesus has enough patience to be not by with everybody except for those that take advantage of his house. Right. Ooh, make me want to be honest with this guy. John Edwards, he, John Edwards was an old school revivalist. He said, it's a dangerous thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Mm -hmm. I, I did something with that too, but I'm not preaching on angry God today. <laughs> Every day Jesus taught in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people, listen, kept looking for a way to kill Jesus. I'm trying to figure out what kind of church leadership is this? Man, you, 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 you scheming to kill somebody? 
Now, what y'all think about that? Because, you know, we read these scriptures just kind of, you know, don't even really hit us. But that'd be like me, Pastor Donna, you know, uh, one of y'all made us mad, do something for me in life. And, and we, 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 we have a meeting to try to figure out how they... <laughs> That's disturbing. I've been reading this my whole life. That thing didn't bother me last night. I was reading another translation to make sure that that was right. <laughs> but they could not find anything that they could do, for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. Okay. Word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Be to God. So we're going to talk about the topic. Uh, going to go kind of back up to verses 41 and 45 where uh, Jesus is weeping over the city. He says, if only you recognize the things that made for peace. If only you recognize the visitation of God. I'll tell you that you better recognize. You better recognize. We're going to talk about uh, a forward discernment. Talk in the name of Jesus. Bless the word of God. That is the us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. Please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. amen. Pass yourself on the chest and say, I better recognize. Amen. I better recognize. Now, we're entering Holy Week. And in many ways, this is always kind of a fascinating, recurring theme and strategy in the Holy Week season. When people who don't believe in Jesus, who don't believe in the historicity of our faith, who want to take every effort to destabilize it and bring question uh, up, they broadcast it on TV, they write all these op-eds on CNN and MSNBC, was Jesus real? Did he really die? Was he just a figment of everybody's imagination? Did he really rise from the dead? And how many of y'all see, see some of these programs out there, History Channel? And everybody got an opinion in a documentary seeking to discredit or diminish or even deny that Jesus actually did what we are celebrating and remembering during this Easter uh, Holy Week and holiday. But I got to admit to you that as I've watched and observed over the last several weeks, I am less concerned about the unbelieving folk outside of our church who want to raise uh, questions about the validity of our faith. I'm more concerned about all of us who claim to follow Jesus. Because mm -hmm. I feel like we're doing a great job making people wonder, is this thing really real? Yeah. I mean, you know, it seems to me that uh, there's a whole lot of things going on in the world, and the response of the church seems to be one uh, of great kind of, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, folks get turned up over some of the most interesting things. <laughs> yeah. Things that I don't think Jesus would turn up over if Jesus was here. I'm not saying Jesus wouldn't call some stuff out, but I mean, folks just seem to get like riled up over things that I just wonder, is this really why Jesus came? Mm -hmm. Jesus come to fixate on some of these small details. You might have met somebody who majors in the minors. Amen. <laughs> I mean, you got, you got a big old major task, and they are just stuck in the weeds. Amen. It's just and you know, I don't know if you ever work with folk like that, just make you not even want to work with them, right? Just get away from me. I'd rather just do the whole thing by myself and be fooling around with all this kind of stuff. I fear when I look at the church, particularly in how we are described in the public imagination, I think we're seen as a train speeding down the tracks of a post-religious America. Understand, we're living in a post-religious age. Dare I say, anti-Christian age, where folk don't necessarily feel like religion serves a purpose. And if you talk to some folks, some folks would think that Christian faith is actually a part of the problem. That was a lot. Amen. And our public witness of Christian faith in this post-Christian, post-church age seems to have uh, really impressed people in a way, uh, impressed upon people 
in a way where people start to feel like, man, what's wrong with the fights that y'all be fighting? Sometimes I feel like the church has gone rogue. And we are spending more time drunk on the power and influence and privilege that is often a result of us being, uh, you know, sometimes the most dominant religion in the world for quite some time. But how many of you know there's a difference between religion and the Jesus movement? Amen. Amen. I mean, Christianity, amen, has its great uh, contributions, amen, to the Jesus movement, but I want you to understand that the Jesus movement, the work that Jesus did, the work that we are called to do, may not always be uh, similar to the Christianity kind of project that seems to just be uh, very kind of run up in, 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 in our country. And I, I, I don't mean to be too too vociferous at this point, but I do want to lift up this idea that sometimes when the church loses the major message of what we are called to preach, we're called to preach that Jesus has come to save us. And be clear, salvation is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. Now, how many, of you, how many of you can't force somebody to take your gift? Amen. Did you know that? Amen? I mean, you, you could, but it wouldn't be a gift no more. Right? It'd be something else. Amen? But a gift is only a gift when it is received by the giver. So all we are called to do is to bear witness to the gift of God and then to take our hands off and let the gift work the way the gift always works. How many of you know, when you give folk Jesus, folk usually take Jesus. But when we give them us, <laughs> it's a mixed proposition, so I say man, right? I mean, if, if they like you, they'll take you. <laughs> Until they don't like you no more. So I say man, amen. I mean, I know y'all, I know y'all, those people don't reject y'all up in here, amen. And I know all y'all just, you know, are affirm and love and embrace every time. Amen. Give your neighbor a high five and tell them, I'm, I'm glad you every time. Come on, give me that. Yeah, yeah. But for me, amen. I am well acquainted with the no. Praise the Lord. No, thank you. Get out of my face. Mm -hmm. I'm cool. Amen. Anybody ever had that happen to them? Rejection. Amen. Guess what? That's what it means to be human. So guess what? If you human. Rest of you raise your hand. I think I know what you are. Amen. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I hope you figure it out one day. And you can tell us your secret, because I don't like being rejected either. Amen? Yeah. But the point of it is this, that if we give people Jesus, how many you know Jesus can work everything out? Yeah. Without your help? Ain't that something? <laughs> Woo. Yeah. Jesus, Jesus can work everything. Somebody say everything. everything. What does that leave out? Nothing. So if we give folk Jesus and let Jesus work in their life the way he works in our lives, how many of you know Jesus will give folk where Jesus wants them to be? Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. He will. It is Jesus' responsibility to save us, yes. to keep us, yes. to sustain us, to redeem us. <laughs> but sometimes I think the church gets caught up in trying to Amen. When, when, whenever you join the church, I didn't force you to join the church. At least I hope I did. And if I did, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I didn't force Cherise to marry me. And if I did, thank you. <laughs> no. No force. Why? We do these things of our own will. Why? Because you can't force folk to do stuff. <laughs> Folks will do it while you're looking. Yes. Yeah. See, that will happen with my kids, you know. Uh, when I'm looking, you know, they love our phones. So, you know, uh, if we don't have a, the secret codes on our phones where, you know, they can't open it, even with all their, you know, high intellect that they get from Sharice, they try to break all the codes like it's a Rubik's Cube and it don't work. Amen. Uh, then that's cool. There ain't nothing on that phone. And we tell them, don't use the phone. We can't even force them to open. Man, you gotta put the fear of God in them little bitches. <laughs> and then even then, they only do it when you're not looking. What I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say that the work of the church is not to force folk to do anything. 
is to help transform people's hearts and minds. So they make decisions willingly to follow the ways of Jesus. But now we got folk who got power and prestige, and they feel like I get the fortune to do stuff. So I'm going to try to pass some law. I'm trying to like preach in a way and do all this different kind of thing to try to force you to do something. And my brothers and sisters, I just want you to know that I don't think that the ways of Jesus are about force. I think the ways of Jesus are about whosoever will. Let them come. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them, let them come. Let them come. Let them come. And, and, and it is this kind, I think, of, 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 uh, of missing the point, if you will, that I'm worried the church has gotten so caught up in, so much so, where not only are the, is the church drinking from this well of power, influence, and privilege, but now many of the disciples of the church drink from the same wells of power and privilege rather than drinking from the wells that require Jesus to go to the cross. And understand, there is a way in our American kind of context where everybody wants to be big. Right? Everybody wants the most Twitter followers. Those Facebook followers. Everybody wants to be famous. Amen. Amen, right? But ain't it interesting that when you follow you end up going to the cross. That's a short line. <laughs> oh, amen. I don't see folks standing outside waiting for my turn. It's my turn at that cross. I can't wait to have that wood just dog through my skin. The splinters and the spike and the crown of thorns. Ooh, that just sounds so appealing. Short line. Yes. The longer lives is the line, or the, 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 where everybody's waiting in, you know, uh, you, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know, you go to Houston Park, and if you ain't never been to Houston Park and roll those rides, how do you judge the quality of a ride? A line. A line. Short line, long line. But how about sometimes the short line ain't about the quality? Ain't about the fun factor. Yeah, sometimes that short line may be the line you need to get in. Because it'll going to do something to you. Amen. It'll build something in you. And I believe that part of what Jesus is calling us to do in this season is to not try and jump into the line, the way of life, the orientation of the world where we can just go the easy way and resist or run away from the hardness that is necessary for our transformation. And here you see Jesus approaching the city and it's clear that something is bothering Jesus. Now Jesus is approaching the city and everybody just gave him the biggest parade. This is probably the time when Jesus' popularity was at his height. His poll numbers through the roof. Everybody's probably like trying to interview Jesus and invite Jesus to go hang out and all the nice parties and Jesus is the man. Right? And Jesus is the least likely to be his popular wife because he came from Nazareth. And Nazareth was not the place popular people came from. So Jesus, you know, was on some kind of ride. But yet Jesus, when he enters the city, the scripture says he cries. And I just want to believe that Jesus today, if he were here right now with us, and he walked into our cities across the country and across the world, I think he would cry again. I know there are many things in our world that is breaking the heart of God. But I believe that. I believe that God's heart is, is just grieved by what we have done with the good thing he left us with. Mm -hmm. How many know God can bless you with a good thing and you can mess it up? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how many know you don't realize you mess up with a good thing? <laughs> until, until it's gone. I mean, actually, you don't miss the water, son. Until mm -hmm. the well runs dry. Amen. You know, like that, you know, 
we was back in, in Barry, my, my great uncle, and it was just great to be around all the country folk, amen, in my family. Everybody had a saying for everything, amen. amen. Write a book of country folk saying. <laughs> there was always truth in it, right? Yeah. This idea that God can bless us with all kinds of things, but if we don't have good discernment, we can mess up a blessing. And, and, and we the kind of folk that are messing up a blessing and then get mad at God. Well, God, you gave it to me. God, why you didn't keep it? It's like, wait a minute. I can bless you, but whose responsibility is to make good decisions along the way? To make sure that thing stays a blessing to you and not a curse. Now understand, most things in this world are neutral. They can be a blessing or they can be a curse. That money you got, it can be a blessing or it can be a curse. And what you do with that money? You can use that money and spend it up on a whole bunch of stuff that bring you misery and then that money become a blessing. I mean a curse. You spend that money on some stuff that will bring life to you and it will be a blessing. Hello, somebody, your friends. They can be a blessing, they can be a curse. I have certain friends for certain situations. <laughs> So all my friends are blessings, praise the Lord. And I need to watch the sports, I got my sports friend. And we bless God together. <laughs> but if I'm going to a crisis, I don't call my sports friends. I just want you to know that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I know not all your friends are created equal. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know why y'all 9 o'clock go like, man, Pastor, you didn't talk about this at 9 o'clock. I know, but I don't know why I'm talking about it today, right now. <laughs> Somebody need to hear it, I guess. Give me that high five and tell them, are equal, praise God. You, you better have good discernment. So you can understand how to use the blessings that God places in your life, or else even the blessing you have can become a curse. Yes. So the, the, the heart of God grieved by seeing all the things happening in the sin. And I believe that if you and I were to tap into the heart of God today, there may be many things that make the heart of God grieve. When you take a look at Jesus crying over the city of Jerusalem, admittedly, he's not crying over the church in Jerusalem. He's crying over the city. The state of the city, the state of the people in the city. That Jesus cared about the city. Ain't that something? The thing that moved Jesus to tears was the state of the city. Now, I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that there may be a tension some of us may have between the state of our cities, the state of our human lives and struggles, and then the spiritualization of our lives where, you know, if I can just get my soul right and everything will be okay, I want you to know that Christ cried for your love, for your quality of life as well. Amen. Amen. That you can't just pull these things apart and live in a fragmented way. Because Christ didn't live that way. Do you understand that Jesus only was concerned about our spirit? He would have just came as a spirit. But guess what? He came as fully human and fully divine. I know it's kind of heavy in here today, man. But I just want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that this is a roadmap, a framework, a, a methodology, if you will, of how you and I must exist if we will have discernment in these moments for us to not miss out on God when God is working and moving in our life. And I don't know if you have any situations where you are feeling like God is working, but you, 
to the fragility of human existence. This idea that truth went active and applied to all the issues and concerns that are going on in our world, it can help bring balance. It can help address the things that are not true. Injustice is an expression of falsified uh, assumptions that you can uh, have a small number of people with a lot of the resources and that's just. No. That you can, you know, uh, choose, pick and choose who you're going to give uh, uh, opportunity to and that's just. No, the truth is this. We have all been created in the image of God. So all of us should be respected even just because we're human. The truth is, when God created the world, guess what? He created everything with enough. Right? You know what enough means, right? It means you got enough. It means that, you know, there's just um, the right amount for everybody to have what they need. But when humanity cobbles everything up out of greed, how many of you know that creates injustice? So peace is not just removing the tension, but pre peace is, is actually introducing truths that create justice. Wouldn't it be interesting if you and I had the ability to discern and make decisions grounded in peace? Yeah, that's good. And truths that are active, like catalysts. Like, 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 like microscopic uh, uh, little machines that are released into every one of your situations. And the truth is working in ways that you yourself would not even be able to understand. Yeah. That truth, when Jesus says, if you know the truth and the truth will make you free, it's because the truth works yeah. in areas where you and I can't even touch. <laughs> My goodness of God. What would it look like in a world so contested to live in such a way that we could discern the things, make decisions and choices that lead to peace? What would it look like if we, the followers of Jesus, hyper aware of this tenuous rigidity of life, we could discern what makes for peace? How would your relationships look different if you could choose the responses that make for peace? Tweet that. 
Praise the Lord. That's good. <laughs>
This is a boy. How about that? A boy. But I believe God sometimes will create an opportunity to serve your enemies. And in the serving, peace is born. That's what we're talking about, turning our swords into plowshares. Sometimes God wants to move us out of the violent confrontational dynamic. Put us in a space where we can serve one another. Give me one more high five and tell them be a peacemaker, be a peacemaker, be a peacemaker. And then the last thing I, I, I'll just mention here is that God is looking for you and I to be able to discern God's presence. Somebody say discern God's presence. Discern God's presence. You better recognize when God shows up. Now be clear, my brothers and sisters, you know, uh, the scripture says that the things that are made for peace are hidden.
And you and I, followers of Jesus, must be clear. God, I don't ever want to miss you showing up. I can miss certain appointments. I can miss certain opportunities. And even as uncomfortable and disappointing as that is, God, I don't want to miss out on your visitation. Some of you know, even when God is not there, God is still working. God's working even when you don't think he's there. That C.S. Lewis quote, quote that I, 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 I think he pulled it up a little earlier. God's presence is not the same as the feeling of God's presence. God may be doing the most for us when we think God is doing the least. Hmm? We, we so feely and touchy in our culture, we think, well, if I don't feel nothing, then God must not be at work. How do you know? We are the only ones bound by our senses. Us. That's, you know, but God ain't bound by what we touch, hear, smell, see, and feel. I mean, look, God can move in ways that are so clear, poignant, so unknown to us until the thing pops up. Like, woo! That's what's called a miracle, right? And some God gets us ready for the miracles in our lives. How can you and I in this season be tuning ourselves to knowing the visitation of God? You better recognize the moment we're in. Don't let this moment slip by you, slip by me, slip by us. This is a season, a special season. Holy Week, Easter, it only comes by once a year. And I believe it's a special, unique opportunity for you and I to take this appointment with God and reflect on the meaning of the life he lived, the way he sacrificed, and the power in which he rose. Don't miss this opportunity. Don't miss this moment. It's the paradox of Easter that you're gonna have these tensions every day in your life, pain and hope, frustration and joy, overcoming and bondage, death and resurrection, but the tension is the gift that points you always to the overcoming Christ who always delivers. Come on, stand up here.